gas laws. The first topic we're going to cover today is called pressure and and what pressure is. So the first thing we're going to do is identify what pressure is the definition. So uh, pressure is where you have a gas that uniformly fills any container, easily compressed and mixes with uh, completely with any other gas. So that's not the definition of pressure, but we're getting there. So pressure is how much force is exerted on the surroundings. OK, so if I I'm going to be working back and forth here. So so you have a container. And in this container. Uh, you have gas molecules that are trapped inside. And what happens is the gas molecules are not uh, standing still. They're moving. They're always in motion. So gas molecules are always colliding into the surface of the container, the walls. So as these gas molecules collide into the surface, it creates what is called pressure. And pressure is the amount of force that is exerted on the surroundings. So you might understand that based off of a tire, OK? So tires are important for us on our cars because it get us from point A to point B. And so what you have to do is you have to inflate your tires with air. Now, you know, your car, most of the modern day cars have sensors inside of your tires, which tells you it comes on and says, hey, you better put air in your tire. Your tire's going flat. And so what you do is you go take the, the air compressor and, and put air into your tires. Now, a normal tire uh, has 32 PSI in it. And so PSI stands for pounds per square inch. And this is a, a form, a unit of pressure. All right, so we we use this in our tires. We use this in other places, but we usually use this in our tires. All right, that's that's commonplace. Now, uh, so in your tires, so this is a wheel, by the way. Make a fancy wheel here. All right, so in your in your tires, you have this pressure. You know that if uh, if you have 32 psi. That's a good bit of pressure inside. Perfect for the tires. My truck, I have 60 PSI in the front tires and 80 PSI in the rear tires because, you know, a truck, you haul stuff. So you don't want to run the same PSI you need. You need usually double that of what a normal car's tires air pressure will be. So now the question is, how do we measure pressure? So we talk about air pressure, you know, the atmosphere pressure. We talk about tire pressure. All these different things has pressure in them. Even a balloon, if you blow a balloon up, all right, it has pressure inside because you and you you put gas in. Now, one thing that I can remember when I was young is that uh, blowing up a balloon was actually pretty challenging because your lung capacity is not strong enough to inflate the balloon when you're young but as you get older your lung capacity builds and gets larger so you get to a point where you can actually blow a balloon up it's actually pretty cool to that feeling that you get yes i blew this balloon up so uh you know if you keep blowing up eventually you're going to reach the point where the elastic breaks because it can't hold the pressure and it pops i hope that doesn't happen to you because that might you might get slapped in the face with a rubber balloon never fun so each one of these cases, you know, you have to measure the pressure. So a, a, a tool that we use, this was this tool is uh, invented many years ago. It's called a barometer. All right, so now what is a barometer? Right, so this is just kind of a, a, a sketch of what a barometer is. So a barometer, if you think about it, it's uh, almost like a fancy graduated cylinder turner upside down. It's turned up upside down inside of a pool of mercury. So this is liquid mercury. Now what happens here is that this liquid mercury travels up inside of this tube. Now this tube is just like a graduated cylinder where it has markings on it. In fact, these are measured in millimeters. And so when the pressure on the outside is exerted down onto the surface of the liquid, this liquid then travels up inside of this cylinder. And what we see is where it stops it. And so 
we measure that in millimeters of mercury. So a barometer is used to measure the pressure of the atmosphere, and normally we measure it in millimeters of mercury. That's the unit that you guys had to convert to. If you go back to your lab one and lab two, you, you ought to remember that you had to make a correction factor based off the atmospheric pressure. And so with, when I went to the, to the instrument, I measured, and most of the time it was like 29. I'm just, just uh, making this number up here. So a lot of times it was around 29 inches of mercury. So it says 29.16 inches of mercury. What I asked you guys to do in that correction factor is you had to convert to millimeters of mercury because that ties back to you know a standard unit that we use for pressure and so now different so there are other units of pressure and so i'm going to talk to you guys for a few minutes about the units of pressure so the one unit is atm all right atm is also called atmosphere so the abbreviation is atm not the thing that you go get money out of. All right, so that's why I lowercase the ATM. So now that's one unit, and that's the standard unit. So your ATM is your base unit. That's the unit that you are going to get comfortable with converting from one unit to this unit. Another unit is millimeters of mercury, which we just looked at, PSI. All right, so I'm going to put a comma here beside millimeters of mercury. I'm going to write TOR. Now TOR, is based off of the scientist Torricelli Evangelisti. If you look at the at the handout that I gave you, so this is the lecture notes here. So if we look, we're right here, and it talks about Evangelisti Torricelli. All right, Torricelli was the first the person that did, invented the the barometer, and in fact, he has the unit tour named after him. All right. So now as, as we look it deeper into these different units, okay, so we know pressure is a force that acts upon us. Now the equation that we use for force, this comes back from physics. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Mass typically is in kilograms and acceleration is in meters per second. So uh, you will see the equation in your homework. So that's an equation that you'll utilize in, in one of your assignments. So now conversion factors, all right? So we're going to learn these conversion factors that are in this list here. I'm going to write them out a little differently than what you see here. So uh, let's talk about the atmosphere and, and PSI, okay? So as we look at the atmosphere and PSI, all right? Uh, so one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI. All right, now I told you earlier that a tire pressure is 32 PSI. So a question that might be asked is, all right, how many atmospheres is that in, with that 32 PSI? So the way we go about working this is, well, it's just like dimensional analysis. So you draw your T chart and you got to know your conversion factor which we know is 14.7 14, 14 PSI per one atmosphere. Now we're looking for atmosphere, so we're going to have atmosphere on top, and then we're going to put our 14.7 PSI on the bottom. Now the PSI cancels out, all right? And so what we do is we divide the 32 by 14.7. And what we end up getting here is 2. Point, now I'm going to go to two sig figs here, so 32 is two sig fig, so I'm going to do 2.2 2, uh, atmospheres. And so that's how your top and atmospheres. Now, to give you an example of this, okay, so we live under the atmosphere, okay, so Earth has an atmosphere, presents its own pressure, which is right around one atmosphere, right? And a tire, at 32 psi it's 2.2 atmospheres that means that inside a tire you're going to feel twice the pressure that you would feel underneath an atmosphere and 
that's so much pressure where you couldn't survive. Our bodies couldn't handle it. It would crush us. So I did talk to you about my tire pressure. So the back tires on my truck are 80 PSI. So how much difference is that compared to a normal tire? So again, we're going to divide 80 by the 14.7. And we end up with 5.4 atmospheres. So at 80 PSI, you have twice the pressure at 32 PSI. So quite a difference in the tire pressure. In fact, if you rode in a truck that had that tire pressure, the road gets really bumpy because of, of how stiff that tire is. So that's one example of a conversion factor. So another conversion factor is that one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury and one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. So that means that for every tor, you're gonna get one millimeter of mercury. So basically tor and millimeter mercury have the same conversion factor, but they're just called something different. So, so let's say we have 32 PSI in a tire, and we want to figure out how many millimeters of mercury of pressure that would be. Now, uh, we've already done part of the work here. So we converted 32 PSI into atmospheres. So that means we have 2.2 atmospheres and so now what we want to do is convert our atmospheres into millimeters of mercury so what we see is we have 760 millimeters of mercury for every atmosphere so what we do is just multiply those two together so 2.2 times 760 gives me 1,672 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you want to keep it to two sig figs, we can just simply round this up to 1,700 millimeters of mercury. So that's a pretty high pressure. And, but again, we, we expect it to be because it's inside of a tire. So, now this also would be the same thing as saying 1700 tor if you wanted to express it in tor so a couple more conversion factors here are pascals so for one atmosphere you're going to get this to be 101,325 pascals or one atmosphere is equal to 101.325 kilopascal. So any questions with anything so far? Now, there is a problem that's in the worksheet here. All right, and that is right here. It says the pressure of a gas is measured as 39 torr. Represent this pressure in both atmospheres and pascals. So, so we got 39 torr. And we want to represent this as atmospheres and pascals so what i'm doing here is kind of setting up a roadmap now you got to remember i've done this a thousand times because i use this lecture notes every semester so uh, for you guys what you need to understand is you got to figure out how to go from tour to pascals you can't convert tour into pascals all in one shot you got to go from tour to atmospheres and then atmospheres into pascals so the way we go about doing that is using those conversion factors 
So we know that 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 for every atmosphere there are 760 torr. And so taking this, we're going to divide that out. So 39 divided by 760 gives me 0 0.051. So two sig figs here, 0 0.051 atmospheres. All right. So that's our first answer. Okay. Now our second thing we're going to do is convert this into Pascal's. So up here we see the conversion factor for from going atmospheres into Pascal's. And so just going through the process, we have 101,325 Pascal's divided by one atmosphere. So the atmospheres are going to cancel out. So you have 0 0.051 multiplied by 101,325. And that gives me a, a value of 5,168. And I'm going to round that up here. So one, eight Pascal's. So if you want to keep this to two significant figures, what you can do is you can round this to 5,200 Pascal's. So that would be the answer to this problem. So, so obviously the conversion factors are important. All right, being that you guys are getting to sit at home and work on this, use some flashcards, try to learn these. Uh, the ones I would suggest you learn are these right here, okay? So, I'm going to circle these and put a star beside them because you're going to utilize those a whole bunch over the next few weeks and actually into uh, Chem 152. So, it's something that you will utilize not just now, but throughout the next two semesters. So, so that's conversion factors. I have a question about that last problem. Go ahead. Um, I got 5,199, um, but when I did my sig figs, it's still 5,200. Yeah. Now, did you carry out all the decimal places? Like when I did 39 divided by 760, I got 0.051315, blow up. So I just did, did it you, all as one thread. So like OK, like, yeah, that's yeah. why. Yeah, that's OK to do that. That's fine. Yeah. That little bit of difference makes us makes a small change in the answer, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. but I mean, but since it was two sig figs, I guess it worked out anyway. Yeah, it sure did. What did you get for the atmospheres in? Did you so? You, what did you, so? You just carried it throughout the entire thing, right? Yeah, I just around. did thirty nine tour and then seven sixty tour on the bottom for the next panel and one ATM on top, and then for the next panel one ATM on the bottom and one thousand one hundred one thousand three hundred twenty five pascals on the top, and then yeah, I just that. did it as one thing. That's fine. And normally, what I would do the same thing. I would just carry it through. But I want y'all to see the individual steps. So perfectly fine to do that. All right. Thanks for asking. All right. So going back to the work to the lecture notes here. So all right. So we are at a point where now we can talk about the next two things. So what I want you to do here is I'm not going to write this again on the other notepad. So standard conditions, zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, STP, write that down. And then right below it, molar volume equals 22.4 liters per mole. All right, so those two things, I want you to write them together in a box, okay? Put them together, put a box around it, and then we will come back to that later on in, in this guide, okay? So, all right, are there any questions on pressure? before we move on. All right, so what I want to do now is look at kinetic. So I'm going to go down, I think it's page eight. All right, so page eight, all right, kinetic molecular theory. All right, so what I want you guys to do right now, if, if you have your phone, take a picture of this. If you are writing notes or if you haven't printed off, 
turn to that page. Uh, we are going to use this, but I'm actually going to go outside to the internet. I got a there's a website we're going to go look at in a second, and uh, that way we can kind of use look at some examples of the kinetic molecular theory. All right, so I'll give you all a second to do that. All right, so uh, we got the picture of this. If y'all have this pulled up where you can see it. All right, then. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a simulation here. All right, so everyone, there's a little dot here. This is a little dot. Uh, this is a gas molecule. How big is that gas molecule in relation to the size of the box that it's in? Very small. Yep, very small. So I'm gonna turn it on. I'm gonna let this gas go freeze. Right now I haven't stopped, all right? What can you say about this gas molecule? What's it doing? How is it moving? Is it moving in curves or is it moving in a straight line? How would you describe its motion right now? I'd say it's moving um, It's moving in straight lines, although it's just because there's nothing obstructing it, it would be considered random if there were more objects. Right, so exactly. So what I'm going to do is speed this up a little bit. So we can. All right, so now we have this molecule moving a little bit faster here. And you can see it's definitely moving in a straight line. Now, is it is it a consistent straight line or is it changing whatever direction it, it just changes to? How would y'all describe its direction? Uh, it's consistent until it hits something that changes its path. Yeah. Now we call that random. All right. It's a it's a random straight line, and that's one of the steps that we see here. And this is it. Is that the move a random straight line? So that's number three. So gas particles moving rapid, random straight line motions. That's that fits the third point. Now the first point says all molecules are considered to be point masses and so that goes back to me asking you a second ago when I stopped it I said how big is it it's not very big at all in comparison so it's really just a point mass now we say a point mass because if I take a, a marker and draw a dot on a piece of paper is that paper going to weigh the same with or without the dot or is it going to weigh different with the dot that's the question now Yes, it's just a dot, but that's the same thing as thinking about a gas molecule in space. Gas molecules in space, even though they're tiny particles, they still have mass to them. And air weighs something. You know that just because if you are if you run track, it's a, or you ride a bike or whatever, it's a lot easier to go higher in elevation and run because the air is thinner up there. When you get down here or below where we live today, and you start waving your hair your hand through the air you can feel the air on your hand in fact do that right now take your hand and wave it in the air just like you don't care feel the air it has some mass to it point masses to be exact each gas molecule that you collide with your hand has some mass to it and together all together they make something they they get that's what we live off of that. So I'm going to turn this back on. Now what we're going to do is we're going to increase the the number of molecules. So all right, so I'm going to put a few in there. OK, so you can see now that, yeah, they're they're very random. They're going all different directions. 
And what happens when they come in contact with each other? Do they curve around each other to avoid each other? Or do they just collide? They collide and bounce back opposite direction. All right, now, what is that band that they put into pants and underwear and other things that that keeps it around you without falling down? Socks is a good example. What do we call it? What type of band Elastic. is that? Yeah, exactly. Elastic. So, exactly. This is called elastic collision. When the gas molecules collide together, they bounce off each other just like a rubber ball would bounce off the ground. That's called elastic collision. And that's another point here, okay? So, so all gas molecules are considered point masses. Gas particles move in rapid with random straight lines. And then they have what is called elastic collisions. I know that's on here somewhere, but I can't see it. Do y'all see elastic collisions or am I just going crazy here? Here they are. So, so number five. So th there are no attractive or repulsive forces that are present. When I said that, do they go around each other? No. They collide straight in each other and bounce off. So energy can be transferred between molecules that collide, but the collisions are perfectly elastic. That's something, that's an important detail there. The other important detail is that there are no attractive or repulsive forces. And we're talking about the kinetic molecular theory. All right, kinetic molecular theory is describing an ideal gas, by the way, all right? And we'll talk about the ideal gas law another day. But for right now, there are no attractive repulsive forces. The collisions are perfectly elastic. That's what you need to write down. All right, so another thing, let's go back to our, our applet here. So now, what would happen if I turn the temperature on? So we're going to stop this, okay? What would happen if I turn the temperature on, the heater on? What if I turn the heat up? What would you expect to happen to the molecules? They would move faster. All right. Now, how many have ever left a soda bottle closed in your car in the dead middle of the summer? How many of you come back and you saw that it almost exploded? Or maybe it did explode. Have you ever had a bottle explode in the car? I've had a sippy cup explode in the car. It's not very fun, is it? Nope. No. So let's watch this. I'm going to turn the heater on here. And so let's, let's watch what happens, okay? Now, uh, so you can see right now that what would you what's the temperature of of this system here would you say the temperature is high or low low and what gives you that evidence that it's low um it's moving slow and it's exactly right and you notice that all the molecules move so now watch this Uh oh, now what's starting to happen? They're moving faster. So what would you say the temperature is now? Um, high. So, I want to stop this for a second. So we talk about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy in motion. What would you say the kinetic energy is dependent on? Okay, I'll ask that again. So what would you say the kinetic energy is dependent on? The temperature of the environment. Exactly. So I'm going to turn this down again. And what we'll see is that the molecules, as they start to cool down, they slow down. I right, definitely can start to see a, a change in the speed. So now here's the fun part. Let's say that we start to increase the molecules.
how would you say the what would you say about the entropy of this do y'all do, do you, if you know what entropy is would you say the entropy is low or high in here what does this make y'all feel like right now does this make you feel like oh my gosh i just i can't stand this it's too much yeah it's too busy yeah now uh so so right now the temperature is relatively low let's say we increase the temperature oh did you did you see what happened there oh boy look at that change that's pretty cool ain't it all right i'm gonna raise the temperature all the way up all right now what does it look like do you think you want to be in this environment I'll tell you what I think it looks like. I think it looks like static on the TV screen. Y'all agree with me or disagree with me? Agree. It does agree. Now I'm going to slow this down a little bit and watch what happens. So we'll just give it a minute here. So you can see that the molecules are still going really fast, but do you see a change in the in the rate of speed? for the molecules now. Can you see that change? And now we're starting to cool down a little bit. So the molecules are getting to relax and and they're just like they're like, OK, this is not bad. They're still colliding together, but it's a lot slower. And there's less entropy present in this state and so now we're going to stop it okay so coming back to this so what what do we see here okay we saw that the first point of the kinetic molecular theory all gas molecules considered to be point masses second point says that the average kinetic energy of of any gas is dependent on the temperature all right the guy third point says gas particles may be rapid random straight lines the fourth point says the volume of a gas is negligible compared to the volume of the container. We did talk about the size of the of the box in comparison to the size of the gas molecule. There really is no comparison. Gas molecules are definitely smaller. And then the last one says that there are no attractive or repulsive forces that are experienced. And the collisions are purely elastic. So now why is it that we learn this? Because as we go through these individual gas laws in the future, we need to understand that the kinetic mode theory, we need to know the, the different points because those points make a difference in the type of, of gas law that we work with. Now, again, most of the gas laws that we're going to work with are dealing with an ideal gas, which is based off the kinetic mode theory. But then there is other gas laws that we will also look at that pertains to real gases in that, hey, they do have attractions and repulsions. We live in a real world. 